Hey everyone, and welcome to WatchGuard Security Week in Review, a video podcast dedicated to quickly summarizing the biggest information and network security stories each week, and to sharing some practical security advice along the way. I'm your all-around security geek and host, Corey Nockreiner, and this is the episode for the week starting April 7th, 2014. This week I'm coming to you from Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, where I've spoken at a Computer World Security Summit both in Singapore and Malaysia. I'm about to catch a plane, so let's jump right into this week's episode. Starting off this week, let's talk about the patches that came out. There was Microsoft Patch Day, where Microsoft released four security bulletins. Uh, one fixed some zero-day vulnerabilities that affected Word, the vulnerabilities I mentioned a few weeks ago. There was a big Internet Explorer patch that was critical, as well as some other Windows and Office updates. So if you haven't got those patches, be sure to go get them. Also, Adobe released some updates during patch day. Specifically, re they released some fixes for Adobe Flash. So if you have any Flash users in your network, be sure to update them as well. And you can get more information on all these updates on the WatchGuard Security Center blog post I did early in the week. The second story I want to cover is about a hacker, a kind of gray hat hacker, who was raided by the FBI this week for doing some unofficial, unsanctioned penetration testing. Throughout different episodes, I've talked about penetration testers. I really like penetration testers. It's good to do if you have companies that approve it, but there are some issues if you do penetration testing that wasn't asked for, some legal issues. And earlier in the week, a pen tester called David Helikowski did a Reddit post where he talked about how the uh, FBI raided him after finding out he was the one that was disclosing some information about vulnerabilities in the University of Maryland's network. Essentially, he worked for a company that was doing some contracting for the University of Maryland. During his work, he found some flaws in University of Maryland's network, which he reported to his company, but the company never reported them to University of Maryland. So he decided to poke around in those flaws himself, and then he reported them to the University of Maryland's uh, IT administrators who didn't do anything about them. As a result, he decided that he needed to show them how serious the flaws were, so he actually used them to steal some information, and he shared that on Pastebin, which is really what got him into trouble, and led to a, a data breach of 300,000 university records. So it really does sound like this guy was just trying to show the university some vulnerabilities and get them to fix it. But really, if you haven't been sanctioned to use vulnerabilities to steal information, if you do any sort of unauthorized access to a computer, that is illegal and that will get you into trouble. So again, another warning to penetration testers out there. What you do is great, but make sure to get your client's approval before doing any penetration testing. So let's move on to what's clearly the biggest story this week. No one can stop talking about the open SSL heart bleed vulnerability. During the week, if you've been reading our blog posts, you know that OpenSSL reported a very serious vulnerability that affects 1.01 versions of OpenSSL. Essentially, many, many uh, applications and, and hardware devices use OpenSSL to provide secure communications. If you go to secure websites and if it happens to be an Apache server, chances are it uses OpenSSL for the secure web communication. And it turns out that as there's a very trivial flaw in something called the heartbeat extension, something that servers and clients use to make sure that they keep connected and have a heartbeat. And essentially bad guys can use this to leak data, leak 64 kilobytes of memory from either a client or a server that has an active SSL connection. And 64k of memory doesn't sound like a lot, but it's very easy to repeatedly exploit this flaw and eventually you can get a ton of information from the victim's memory, such as uh, key information, usernames and passwords, and eventually even the certificates and everything you need to decrypt the secure communications and see what users are doing. So it is a very significant vulnerability. So hopefully you've read the blog post, but essentially here are the tips. If you specifically use the OpenSSL package anywhere, you need to update it if you use 1.01. You need to go get 1.01G. Now, if you use 0.98 versions, the older versions of OpenSSL, you're fine. It's not vulnerable, so you don't have to worry about it. 
On top of that, there's many other devices and software packages that come with OpenSSL. So throughout the weeks, you might learn that various vendors you use have OpenSSL on their products. Be sure to follow the advice and update those products as well. By the way, for the WatchGuard customers, we were vulnerable to this flaw. We do use OpenSSL on our products. So if you're an XTM user, if you have a modern XTM device that runs 11.8, it was vulnerable. But the good news is early in the week we released an update 1 for 11.8.3 that fixes this flaw so you can go get it. If you use older devices that use 11.7 or lower, they are not vulnerable so you don't have to worry. We also did find that our XCS appliances are vulnerable to this vulnerability, but only the secure mail component. Furthermore, the secure mail component works in a way that it's only communication between WatchGuard and the secure mail cloud servers that is vulnerable to this flaw. So it's really only us that can take advantage of it, and of course we're not going to. So really, while XCS is technically vulnerable, there's very, very little real-world risk for XCS appliance holders. Nonetheless, do expect a patch for that as well. Finally, for SSL VPN appliance owners, we do not use vulnerable versions of OpenSSL there, so you are fine. Another tip you really should know about if you use OpenSSL anywhere is upgrading alone is not enough. After you upgrade, Really, there's a chance that bad guys out there could have been exploiting this and could have been stealing information via this OpenSSL flaw, including the digital certificates in your software or on your appliances. So after you upgrade your OpenSSL uh, web server or OpenSSL appliances, it's very important that you regenerate your digital certificates. And by the way, if you use our products, you can find out how to do this in the release notes of 11.8.3 update 1. So do that as well. You may also have to go and update your passwords on all the websites out there that use OpenSSL. For instance, if, if Tumblr was vulnerable to this flaw because they used OpenSSL, once Tumblr fixes this vulnerability, it's a good idea to change your password. And by the way, that's important. If you change your password before the vulnerable web server fixes it, a bad guy can just exploit it again to get your new password. So wait until you hear from various vendors that it's been fixed. So it's a very interesting flaw. We'll probably be talking about it for months. If you really want more details, be sure to check our blog post about this issue. It contains links to all kinds of other resources as well. Well, that's it for this Asian on the road version of WatchGuard Security Week in Review. Thank you for joining us. I hope you found it interesting. As always, be sure to check the WatchGuard Security Center blog regularly for more security updates. You can also follow me on Twitter. I'm at SecAdept or follow WatchGuard at WatchGuard Tech. Thank you for watching and here at WatchGuard, we're rooting for you.